Here Come is an ongoing webcomic that was started in 2020 by American cartoonist Holly Dittus. I got into it recently, as in within the last year, and in just that time, I not only think that this series has the potential to be one of the greatest of all time, but with what's there currently, it's already one of my all-time favorites. As of time of writing, the series is on Chapter 17, which is the conclusion to the first real fight between protagonist Carrie Com with her fellow Drithers and the antagonist Carmichael. So I feel like I can talk about everything I want and neither of us have to worry about spoiling the whole thing because it's still pretty early into its run. Presumably. Before I begin though, I should disclose that, also within the last year, I become good friends with the author. She had no involvement in this video other than telling me how to pronounce the name of the characters after I asked. Because I figure, you know, this might be the first time people hear their names spoken out loud and I don't want to imprint their brains with the wrong pronunciation. But either way, I recognize that this may bias my opinion. However, I think my argumentation stands on its own merit, so don't worry. First off, one of the most immediately striking things about Tercom is the art style. I don't even know exactly how to describe this, it's an unconventional mix of things. There's an extreme exaggeration and abstraction that makes a lot of things look almost cartoon-like, but there's also a lot of detail, a lot of intense, sketchy line work. Every shadow is a hundred lines to express darkness rather than a solid color, every outline and panel frame is slightly off-kilter. It gives everything a very intense or energetic feel, like everything has at least a little bit of motion or texture to it. And surprisingly, that works most of the time. Even in the calmer scenes, it gives off a sense of depth or anxiety, which so far has fit the feelings of the main cast. It's pretty radical, I think, especially for the genre. Most action or drama series would save this kind of detail for, well, moments of action or drama. Which isn't to say that Turcom doesn't deliver in those fronts, no. Some of the most detailed and some of my favorite pages are from big dramatic reveals or big hits during fight scenes. You can really feel the intensity of a moment or the motion and visceral pain on display when someone takes a punch. I don't even know what to say aside from just showing them, like it speaks for itself. But despite the often maximalist approach, it still manages to create emphasis and manage tone through detail in a unique way, with, of all things, minimalism. Removing detail, breaking characters down to plain silhouettes and simple backgrounds. This is used quite a few times during Carrie Com's mid-fight breakdown, allowing it to instill not just strangeness but a hollowness and isolation as well, which perfectly fits with how she feels at the time. I will admit, in the first five or so chapters, the art style is a bit rough. It still shows the positive qualities I mentioned, but you can really see the progress made between these two scenes we've drawn. The same can be said for the paneling and flow, which I think is fine in the beginning, though sometimes, like during big action scenes or the one big exposition scene, it's a little hard to parse at first glance. There's still some standout moments early on, like the slug ability explanation being framed literally by the slug. But either way, by the end of the first fight, it really hits its stride. That part is smooth as butter. Aside from early paneling though, there's a clear knowledge of technique and convention on display here. One of my favorite parts is Kyrie's introduction shot, where he's drawn without a mouth, which in comics normally indicates an exaggerated expression of silence or an emphasis on the eyes, which certainly works here too, but no, he actually doesn't have a mouth on his face, it's on his hand. That's a cute little subversion I think, and the location of his mouth is a detail that's well paid attention to for the rest of the arc. And then of course there's the character design. There's an obvious focus on not so much realism or uniformity, but with making cool distinctive appearances. I would perhaps call them cricked up. In particular, there's a lot of clear variety to be seen in the eyes, arms, and hair. It's quite easy to tell from a glance a difference between Carrie Com's gaunt, sunken eyes and Mox's beady eyes and glasses, or Rainbow's triangular sunglasses and later multiple irises, or Karmi's sharp, small pupils. You can distinguish their arms by Rainbow's muscles, Mox's skin tone, the different clothes they wear, and sometimes the arrows on Carrie Com's arms. And you can easily tell apart Carrie Com's segmented, messy hair, Mox's sleek bob cut, Rainbow's short hair under a beanie, and Carmichael's spiky mane. All of these things are really good to help distinguish what's going on, even during scenes of intense action where everything is big, chaotic, and exaggerated, and in times where there's focus given to specific parts of a person, like just their eyes, which is very common. And of course this contributes to the general visual storytelling. In general, characters and emotions are pretty obvious. Some standout parts for me though. The chessboard pattern background with minimal detail conveys both the emotional state and tone of the conversation as well as its subject. And the arrows for Carrie Com's abilities as well as the aura for Moxes help to make these complex sounding abilities a lot easier to comprehend. Same goes for the visualization for Penguin and Rat abilities, though I'd say, well you could probably understand something like Carrie Com's abilities without a single word. It might be harder to understand the Penguin system with that explanation. Ooh, with that said, great time to segue into the writing. Let me start from the top, I guess, with the setting itself. The setting of Tiercom is almost entirely constructed, as in made up in a way that doesn't reflect real life, as opposed to something more grounded like speculative fiction or urban fantasy. The few environments we've seen are nothing like what exists on real life Earth. The wildlife, while drawing from real animals, are unique because many of them are much larger and have enormous cubic tumors on their backs. There's also 
th this thing. Those tumors seem to have supernatural properties, unique to each species of animal. The humans of this world have apparently researched and cataloged the properties of these tumors to the point where many are treated no more spectacularly than any other feature of an animal. One might talk about the tumor on a penguin's back that grants someone the ability they most desire, the same way they talk about penguins being flightless birds. The humans themselves seem to mostly match human biology from real life, the only differences I've noted perhaps being merely a product of the exaggerated art style or mutations caused by the character's own supernatural abilities. Regardless, their culture is entirely alien. Their architecture is unlike anything I've seen in the real world. Many words and names are made up for this series, further implying a distinction in language from real life English. And the Drithers, the only occupation we've yet seen, don't have any real life analog, besides I guess just the government? Like all the government in general. Which makes sense I guess, if people had superpowers in real life it would be hard to stop them from becoming the government. Anyway, I like settings such as this. It's a personal preference that I imagine is shared by a lot of people, considering the popularity of series such as Pokemon or Star Wars or whatever. If a series can basically exist within the real world, that's not a knock against it, but a crafted setting is useful because it can take the plot and characters in unique directions. More than anything, it gives potential. And the series has already acted on some of that potential. We've already seen combat, detainment, execution, harvesting, travel, and meetings conducted by Drithers. And we've already gotten a glimpse of some of the special animals and supernatural abilities. In addition, the setting can reinforce the themes of the series. I guess I don't know what role Drithers will play on the themes, but the animals and ability systems have already made themselves pretty clear. The opening chapters note the variance of animals and speculate on how many are sentient. Later, on the topic of abilities, it's explained that powers can be acquired in three ways. The tumor on a rat's back gives one the ability they most need, the tumor on a penguin's back gives one the ability they most desire, and the tumor on a slug's back gives a random ability. The associated risk forces people to ask themselves a philosophical question. Do you want guaranteed success, ultimate self-expression, or will you risk it all for something greater? What exactly this will all build to hereafter, well, I don't know but I'm excited for it, that's for sure. Another thing I love is that most of these details of the setting are communicated naturally, usually through visuals or subtlety. No one sits Carrie calm down to be like, did you know that every animal is very big and has a magical tumor on his back? That's kind of just how things are. No one goes around saying, I'm a drither and that means this and that. They just say, I'm a drither, gotta do my drither duties. And then they go do something. That's part of the reason I'm still not quite sure what exactly drithers are, but it's clear that an answer exists. When I say most though, there is one particular exception, one which admittedly I'm mixed on. The explanation for ability acquisition is delivered in a long exposition dump that, despite its wonderful visuals, comes across like a character literally reading from a Wikipedia page. However, it's true that this is justified within the narrative, and the art and entertainment value makes it actually pretty nice to read through. This is not a slog by any means. I mean, I've read through it like five times while making this video. But it was one of the only times in the series I really felt the hand of the author, so to speak. Now, I make these criticisms, not being able to look at alternate realities, or knowing exactly what the future holds. It's quite possible that the knowledge and execution of the abilities exposition will make the next few chapters both comprehensible and high quality. Something that couldn't have been achieved by withholding those explanations or sprinkling them in over the course of 20 chapters. I do think it's good to distance exposition from its use, after all. And maybe this is just the author's way of communicating to the viewer that whatever mysteries or systems are in place will be elaborated upon with interesting explanations. Something like, oh yeah, see the creativity and coolness I put into this? That's going to the rest of the series, baby, just you wait. And while I do believe that, again, I cannot see into the future. And I gotta say, I do really like the power system going on here. It's reminiscent of your typical battle shown in Fair where everyone has their own unique abilities, such as Jojo's Bizarre Adventure or Madaka Box, two series which I believe were inspirations for the author. Much like in those series, a person's power indicates a lot about them, but in Turcom, not necessarily in the sense that their power perfectly fits their personality, but the animal they got the power from may say a lot about them. And the few powers shown off so far are all pretty unique and have displayed a decent amount of versatility so far. Karakom's flinging arrows can be applied to objects instead of projectiles, but they can also be used on herself to give her punches a lot more power. Mox's telekinesis Nieces can make them float, but it can also shoot marbles or redirect oncoming attacks. Clevelmus's extension ability can make a pencil longer, but it can also give him a thread to bring himself closer to the opponent. And Clevelmus now has a second ability too, which may have its own variety of uses or even mingle with one he already has in cool ways. I assume as well, plenty of the main characters are made up having two, three, maybe even four or five different abilities, so the possibilities are endless. You even have unique cases like with Rainbow. His ability to read minds is not exactly a combat ability, but he makes up for it by being extremely buff. Karikom even notes he covered his weakness, which is honestly a great thing because it shows that these things such as strength and technique still matter in a world where people fight with magical abilities. It's a way to ground power in something feasible rather than having it be completely abstracted like flying around and shooting lasers, which has a different appeal, I guess. This could be expanded to someone who has an actual fighting style or is chained with a weapon, presumably in a way that isn't just using it as a projectile. And these powers are used in ways that aren't just for flashy combat, despite what Kerry Khan would believe. Riddle Seer's ability is that anyone who's around him for more than 30 minutes dies. And with that, we just get so much from him. His job is as an executioner for people who want slow but 
painless deaths. And while his ability is effective for that, it also means that he struggles to form connections with people. He wonders what it's like to ride a train with other people in it. He's anxious about Carrie Khan wanting to meet him. In a combat situation, well, so long as he isn't taken out prematurely, he's a slow acting instant wind button, which might not be the most interesting on its own, I imagine, but his short part of the story is focused more on psychological conflict, both with his own feelings and against the intimidating inmate C2309. The inmate pries into real Sierra's insecurities, and although we haven't quite seen the consequences of their interaction, it feels like he won somehow, you know? Riddle Sierra's two-chapter escapade was also shown off as a short story outside of Tyrkom, titled C Block, which I think just shows how strong it is. But that stuff, that's all like big picture stuff. What's the nitty gritty experience you're getting, really? I think the best parts to pick would be the conversation in chapters 10 and 11 and the fight from chapters 12 to 17. In this casual conversation, much of the dialogue is very naturalistic, and I like that. I can actually see people talking like this in real life, maybe not about these things specifically, but it's good for establishing characters as human and relatable before you put them in a situation with stakes. You really get a sense of personality and voice with each character. Carrie Com has a very awkward cadence, very stiff diction, slow paced delivery, sometimes split across multiple bubbles, and a noticeable amount of sentence fillers. Rainbow is very direct, blunt, to the point, no hesitation or extra fluff, as clear as you can be about everything. And then Mox is really talkative, chiming in with what they're thinking and feeling and being the one to ask how others are doing, where the other two are a lot more reserved in comparison. There's still a bit of awkwardness with Mox, but it's more in how much they talk, the needless detail comes across as fling silence. When it comes to Drither duties, Carrie Com is a lot more talkative and leads the conversation. It all fits their personalities. Mox is friendly and personable, but still new and they're trying to fit in. Carrie Com is pretty grumpy and seemingly introverted, but she likes Drither stuff. And I can imagine that a mind reader like Rainbow wants to minimize verbal communication because he already knows what people are going to say. Most of their dialogue doesn't take quite the same format once the battle starts. Starts, they're obviously in a different situation than casual conversation. Except for Rainbow, he gets a little more shouty but he's still direct and blunt. Most of the time he comes across as a leader during the fight, which really works because of his ability to coordinate and his sheer physical strength. The fact that the direction of the fight communicates that is really good. And then there's Carmichael. I already said this, but I just love his introduction page. There's just such a chaotic and sinister energy here, and it fits because right off the bat he throws everything into chaos. Rainbow's freaking out, things are getting thrown around, no one knows exactly what's going on, etc, etc. There's just so much I could say about Carmichael. Honestly, I love this guy, a kiki-shaped fella if I've ever seen one. He works so well as the first villain, he manages to lead the fight the whole time either perfectly countering the Drifter's attacks or manipulating them to get in a more favorable position. Carmichael doesn't quite have the same naturalistic dialogue the other characters have, and I think that's deliberate. Like, this is something I'd say with my buddies on the couch, this is something I'd say in a comment section to piss somebody off. It manages to sell him as a bombastic villain in a short amount of time by just having him be sneeringly, theatrically evil. He's always smiling and amused, and he takes every opportunity to taunt people or catch them off guard, never stumbling or faltering. It's obvious he enjoys fighting people and fucking around with them, but it doubles as a way to get into the heads of his opponents, and it really works on Carrycom. I really think this works perfectly as the first arc villain. If he never shows up again, it's fine, because he established himself effectively, but if he does show up again as a recurring villain, no matter how far in the future that happens, it's still gonna work, because we know him. We know what he's like. We're gonna understand it. Either way, he's really left his mark in this series by being one of the catalysts for Carrycom's development here. On that note, you know, narrative and character development through battle is one of the best things about all sorts of shonen battle series. And in just this first fight, we get development for Carrie Com. Or, I guess this is more of a character establishing moment. Like, this seems pretty early on in the series, so I'm guessing we're gonna get to see more of this radiant go-getter carry com than the grumpy insecure carry com we started with. Her mistakes during this battle and the relative competency of Mox and Rainbow make her question herself. It makes her feel insecure rather than prideful. It makes her think, maybe I am a hater. Her inner dialogue loses the naturalistic tone it had before, which again, I think it makes sense. You know, realistically writing down someone's inner monologue train of thought might not hit as hard as something more structured and sculpted with a clearer prose. The visual chaos, cluttered paneling, and all the words she takes to think about the situation making way for the two simple panels forming our conclusion makes it hit so much harder. She just wanted to have fun fighting. She's envious of other people who have fun when she can't or doesn't. And she's not having fun because she's too worried about wanting to seem cool to being tactical. Rainbow fighting by just straight up punching probably contributed to this revelation because it is very simple. He's a big strong punch man, but he's effective. When she sees Mox just like super beat the fuck up, Carrie Com snaps out of it and turns the tide of the fight completely. She develops a new technique, she names it, she starts having fun. At one point she feels a pang of self-doubt, the visual language showing a contrast of her insecurity with her gut feelings, and she concludes with why does it have to be more than a regular punch? And that's peak fiction. Starting from her mid-fight breakdown to the end, we get allusions to basically all the scenes Carrie comes in a part of. Her cold attitude towards Mox and Cleveland Miss, her childhood 
childhood dream of being a drifter, even her friendship with Redelsia. It feels like a grand culmination for her entire character, but like, <laughs> there's only 17 chapters. That's why I'm recommending this series, I tell you. It's already done so much, so I'm just thinking, imagine what it could do in the future. I have thought about that a lot, actually. And now, I don't usually engage in baseless speculation. Maybe this isn't the time to do it. But I imagine Caricom's probably gonna get a second ability, whether it's because of her previous insecurity or her rediscovered desire to just have fun. It would clearly help her along. I guess the question is, what will it say about her then? Will she get another rat ability and breeze through the series unmatched? Will she get a penguin ability and take it as proof she's developed as a person? Will she try for a slug ability? And if so, will it turn out to be an amazingly useful ability or a terribly detrimental one that she now has to deal with forever? Maybe all of these will happen. That's technically possible. Maybe. Maybe I'm wrong and she won't get any abilities. Either way, I trust that it's going to get even more interesting from here on out. So yeah, go, go, go read Turcon. There's a website for it. It's also on Webtoons and Manga Decks. And the author also posted on Twitter many ways to engage with it however you want to. And that's the video! Okay, short story here. Back when I finished the script, my husband got sick and I was like, okay, before I get sick myself and my voice gets fucked up, I should record this so I can edit it during. And I guess I rushed because I didn't do a good job. So much of the audio was bad. I had to re-record a week later, but I didn't want to like re-record all of it. So there's just some jarring audio changes. Sorry. And the visuals, okay. When I talk about video game stuff, it's easy because I can just use random gameplay as background footage when I'm too lazy. Because I didn't really work with a comic, so this is probably the most effort I put into editing something, even if it's my shortest video so far. But it was worth it, you know? I wanted to talk about this. I might talk about this series again when it progresses along a lot more, you know, when there's more to say besides just, oh, this new chapter was pretty good. <laughs> Maybe when there's a whole arc to discuss. No disrespect to people who do chapter 279 reaction, but that's just not how I roll. And yes, I'll definitely be making a video about the author's other series, but only when there's more to talk about. Right now there's only like six chapters and they're really short. I might end up repeating a lot of the same things I said about the art and the writing style in this video because, you know, it was definitely made by the same person. So I at least want to put some space in between this video and that one. I'll at least say that the strengths of Tiercom all carry over or translate really well into this new genre and format. All these experience since starting Tiercom really shows. The pacing is perfect, it's good, and I love it, and you should read it too. Until next time, bye-bye.